Okay. Um, so good morning, Ruben. Thank you for joining us all the way from the West Coast. I know it's early for you. Uh, I'm just going to very quickly read your bio and then please go ahead with your presentation. Um, so uh, Professor Rose Redwood is a professor in the Department of Geography at the University of Victoria and the director of the Critical Geographies Research Collaboratory. Um, he co-founded and serves as chair of the Committee of Urban Studies, which organizes the City Talks, which is on YouTube and it's very, very cool. I've checked out some of those videos. Um, he's also a member of the Cultural, Social and Political Thought Program. He's also the managing editor of Dialogues in Human Geography, as well as associate editor of the International Journal of Teaching and Learning in Higher Education. And in his spare time, his children are learning from home and like all of us, enjoying that. So uh, go ahead, uh, Ruben, take it away. All right, thanks so much, Stephanie. And uh, I'd like to thank you all for, for joining us and particularly thank Stephanie for inviting me to, uh, to speak to your class today. Uh, as Stephanie mentioned, my name is Ruben Rose Redwood, and I'm a professor of geography here at the University of Victoria. Uh, and I'm speaking you, uh, to you today from the traditional territories of the Coast Salish peoples, specifically the Songhees, Esquimalt, Wasanich nations, uh, in what's otherwise known as Victoria, British Columbia. Just a little background about my, myself. Um, I'm actually originally from the United States. Uh, most of my family's from New York City. Uh, I grew up in the Washington, D.C. area. Uh, went to the University of Virginia for uh, undergraduate, uh, was part of the class of 2000, um, majored in environmental sciences, so more on the physical science side of things as an undergrad. Uh, but then I um, <clears throat> transitioned to the, to, uh, the social sciences and, and human geography in particular uh, for my graduate studies at Penn State University, where I did my master's and PhD, uh, graduating in 2006. And for my PhD, I was, uh, from, for my graduate work more generally, I was interested in urban historical geography and, um, and cultural landscape studies. And it's both of those uh, interests that led me to an interest in studying the politics of place naming, uh, which I'll be discussing uh, with you today. Um, so I got my PhD in 2006. Um, I uh, was on the job market, didn't get, got a few interviews, didn't get any jobs, and Penn State uh, hired me as a lecturer for a year. And then during my second year on the job market, I got both a, a postdoc fellowship at the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C., as well as my first tenure track position at Texas A&M University. So I kind of split my time between those two places uh, for that first year in 2007, and then, uh, or I guess 2008. And then um, in 2009, I relocated here to the University of Victoria, where I've been for the past decade now, uh, just promoted to full professor this past July. Uh, so uh, so that's, uh, it, it's really been uh, great to be here um, and to kind of develop my research and things like that. Uh, and so today, um, what, I'm, what I'd like to share some ideas, I know this is somewhat of an informal session today, so I, I hope we can have a, a lot of discussion towards the end. Um, but I'd like to share some ideas that I've been thinking a lot about lately, both in terms of my research and some of the activism I've been, I've been engaged with, as well as my interactions with students and teaching in the classroom related to the spatial politics of commemoration. Uh, and um, place naming plays a central role in that, but uh, this is also kind of connected to the debates and controversies over statues and monuments and, and various other forms of, of commemoration in the landscape as well. And as many of you know, um, debates and controversies over statues, monuments, and place names have become major focal points uh, for broader political struggles uh, over historical memory. And such debates, of course, have a long history, uh, but have particularly gained public attention since 2015 uh, in the United States with the um, removal of various Confederate uh, symbols, uh, place names, uh, statues, and, and Confederate flags. Um, in response to the Charleston massacre in South Carolina, uh, where a white supremacist went into an African-American church and, and murdered uh, various uh, 10 or so people. Uh, and also in 2015 in South Africa, uh, the Roads Must Fall movement uh, got uh, kicked off with a student-led effort to remove a statue of Cecil Rhodes from, um, from the campus. Uh, and this, this uh, Roads Must Fall movement then uh, gained momentum in the U back in the UK as well. So these issues have been going on for some time. They've gained quite a bit of public attention uh, in the past decade or so. And since the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville, which was also a response to, uh, to uh, an attempt to rename uh, a park and remove a statue of a Confederate kind of hero uh, from the Civil War era uh, as well. But um, 
So, so in recent years, this, these issues have gained a lot of attention, but this is something that's been going on for quite some time in terms of constructing commemorative landscapes, uh, making remake and remaking those landscapes and the debates that, that kind of follow from that. And whenever there's an effort to you know, remove a statue or rename a place um, uh, that honors white supremacists and colonizers who've committed genocide, um, we often run up against a series of reactionary uh, criticisms and responses uh, that most notably that these efforts erase history. And so uh, I wanna talk about some of uh, those kind of responses and some of my counter responses to those today as well. Um, so in any case, um, uh, today I wanna talk uh, a bit about some of the work on critical toponymies to start with. Uh, and um, this toponymy, of course, referring to place naming. Uh, and um, <clears throat> so just to give a little background about the study of place naming more generally, uh, and this is an interdisciplinary kind of field. Uh, I come to it from, as a geographer. Uh, and in the field of geography, uh, over the past century, there have been um, you know, various studies about place naming. Much of the early work was kind of more of an encyclopedic and antiquarian approach uh, that compiled, where scholars would compile long lists of different place names for different cities or different regions uh, and, um, and then uh, you know, kind of publish uh, encyclopedic uh, volumes related to place names about the origins of the names and the meanings of the names and who the, who the places are named after and, and those sorts of things. And th those are uh, certainly valuable uh, you know, uh, contributions to, to, to scholarship. Uh, but one of the things that happened um, in the 1980s and 90s is that there was a shift in, in the study of place naming to looking at not just the names themselves, but to look at the, the process of naming and the, in oftentimes the contested politics of place naming as well. Uh, and so some early work by scholars like Maus Azaryahu, Brenda Yo, and others um, uh, started to develop this, particularly related to, to the politics of street naming in particular, uh, during the 1990s especially. Uh, and then um, in the first decade of uh, the 21st century, um, that's kind of where I came onto the scene. And you know, I just got my PhD and I had been studying some of these issues. Uh, and so in 2007, um, I, along with uh, some colleagues, organized a, a mini conference on the politics of place naming uh, that we held in, um, at Derek Alderman's uh, uh, you know, kind of where he kind of hosted us in North Carolina, and it was there were scholars from uh, from from Finland, from Australia, from various parts of the world that that attended this this mini conference, uh, and part of what came out of that were um, were a number of things, but just to focus on two, um, two of the participants at that workshop, uh, Lawrence Berg uh, from UBC Okanagan and uh, Yanni Voltinaho from Finland. Um, uh, edited a, uh, uh, an edited book uh, called Critical Toponymies, which brought together um, various chapters. Uh, I, I have a chapter in the book, which was a reprint from an article I had published and, and a number of other um, uh, people who are interested in the politics of place naming uh, kind of contributed to that volume, which has had a pretty big impact in the field. Uh, and that same year, 2009, when that book was published, uh, Derek uh, Alderman and Mal Zazaryahu and I published uh, uh, kind of uh, a key piece in progress in human geography on critical place name studies and thinking about kind of new directions in the field where we kind of reflect on the more encyclopedic and antiquarian approaches and then kind of think about how the field has changed over time uh, with this turn towards the politics of place naming. And so some of my, my own work, uh, my, I started out looking at um, uh, the politics of street naming in New York City during the 19th and 20th century. So it was very much of a kind of historical interest uh, that came out of my earlier work looking at the grid street plan of 1811 uh, in New York City <clears throat> and how the grid, which was uh, had numbered streets, uh, how some of those numbered numerical streets were then renamed uh, in the 19th century by wealthy landowners on the Upper West Side who renamed the avenues, you know, um, Central Park West and Columbus and Amsterdam Avenues uh, as, at, at the same time that they were trying to evict uh, working class tenants uh, on their lands as the as the real estate industry was booming in the in the 1880s and 1890s. Uh, and then I contrasted that with um, the renaming of streets in Harlem uh, a century later in the 1980 uh, 80s and 90s with um, looking at how uh, streets were renamed to commemorate uh, African-American civil rights leaders like Martin Luther King and Malcolm X uh, and others. 
Uh, and so in any case, I won't go into all the details about that, but just as background, uh, this kind of culminated in, um, in an edited book that I published with Derek and Maus in 2018 on the political life of urban streetscapes, <clears throat> where we have chapters um, uh, from various authors looking at <clears throat> the politics of street naming in cities around the world. Uh, and so this is actually one of the first um, and only books that has really focused on the politics of street naming in particular. Um, so that's some of my earlier work. Um, more recently, I, you know, I've been here at UVic for a century, uh, not century, a decade now, feels like a century. Um, and uh, and so, uh, so obviously, you know, indigenous politics are, are pretty, uh, pretty uh, important here on the West Coast. Uh, and so I've, uh, through interacting with indigenous students who have taken my classes, as well as indigenous faculty who I've have collaborated with both here at UVic as well as uh, elsewhere in um, uh, uh, Nache Blue Barnd and Anita Lucchesi uh, in the United States, uh, as well as a few of my grad students, we edited a special issue of a journal called Cartographica <clears throat> on decolonizing the map, uh, which is an effort to kind of recenter indigenous mappings of, of, of spaces and places. Uh, and so there are a number of um, papers in that special issue that also deal with place naming uh, and indigenous place naming in particular. And um, just a little more uh, recently, uh, I've also been interested in uh, this research, not just in terms of research, but also in terms of teaching and how this kind of plays into the classroom setting, which maybe ties into some of the work that you all are doing for this directed study. Uh, Derek and I published a piece looking at um, the renaming of places on university campuses and how um, you know, how we can think about developing strategies within say the undergraduate classroom to get students to think about the politics of place by, by having the students study the politics of place naming on, on their campus. Uh, and this is actually every, every spring I teach a course on social and cultural geography, uh, which I'm teaching right now, in fact, and the very first lab that I have them do is I, I give them a list of all the names of all the buildings on campus, and they have to do kind of a, a critical analysis of the cultural landscape, looking at gender, for instance, how most of the commemorative names are named after men rather than women, and, and various other uh, kind of aspects as well. Uh, so, so I'm very much interested in the politics of, of place naming from my research angle, but also within my teaching. Uh, and I currently have a SHRC grant along with my, my wife, uh, Cindy Ann Rose Redwood, and, and we're probably gonna be collaborating with Derek Alderman <laughs> as well for the project, uh, where we're looking at um, controversies over commemorative um, commemoration and commemorative landscapes on university campuses in particular. <clears throat> and um, so we're still in, in the process of doing interviews uh, with people across uh, the US and Canada related to this topic, although COVID obviously has, has put uh, some, um, some limitations on that. Uh, but one thing that we have developed is a, um, a comprehensive database of university naming policies uh, in Canada and the US also looking at naming controversies and things. And if we have time at the end of uh, the session today, um, I'll, I'll share with you uh, the web map and the story map that we're, we're creating for that, which you can see one, one uh, kind of image here. Um, and um, I'll show you maybe a more interactive version of this uh, later, maybe at the end of the presentation. So just um, to get back to this question of, um, of debates over commemoration, place naming and uh, statues and monuments and things, there are a number of key common arguments that often arise in these sort of debates. So I just want to kind of lay these out at the outset um, and give you my take on them. <clears throat> so as I said, the first um, kind of key argument that you often hear is that renaming a place erases history. Uh, and my response to this is that, um, is that it, this argument conflates the remembering of the past with honoring particular historical figures by placing them up on a pedestal. And in the case of statues, you know, you're literally physically placing them up on a pedestal. Uh, place names are, you know, maybe a little different. You're putting them up, their name on a sign, but it's a similar process. So this, so we really need to be mindful of uh, kind of not conflating these two, uh, these two things because uh, commemoration is an honorific process. It honors the person uh, or event that is being commemorated, right? And so that's an important thing to keep in mind. The second key argument that you often hear is that you can't judge the past by present day standards. Yet I would argue that, that we really can't avoid judging the past by present day standards. I mean, what other standards are we going to judge the past by? Uh, are we going to judge the past um, by the white supremacist standards and racist standards of the past? Is that how we in the present should judge the past? Um, and another kind of element to this is that by us maintaining 
honorific commemorations of, say, white supremacists or slave owners or race, other races, um, we in the present become complicit in bestowing honor and continuing to bestow honor on these historical figures in the present. Uh, and so I would argue that the present generation need not be placed in a straitjacket by the commemorative decisions of past generations, because we ourselves, and every generation for that matter, um, is part of history and we can make changes to the cultural landscape and the commemorative landscape. And that's what past generations have done as well. Uh, another key argument that you often hear is the slippery slope argument. If you rename one place, you have to, you're gonna see a wave of renaming every place in a city or on a university campus. Uh, and um, just empirically, from an empirical standpoint, this is not often not the case. Um, you know, here at the University of Victoria, I'll, be t I'll, I'll briefly mention an example of a, of a building that was renamed on campus. And that was a question that one of the administrators had asked me was, well, if we rename this building, are we then gonna have to rename all the buildings on campus? And, and this has not come to pass, right? Now, there are some cases, especially in uh, moments of major political turmoil, uh, you know, political revolutions, think about the fall of the Soviet Union or um, a decolonization in Africa, for instance, where you do see a wave of, of place renamings or, or, or other commemorations. Uh, and so, um, but that being said, um, you know, in, in many cases, a slippery slope argument doesn't, doesn't really, uh, uh, doesn't hold grounds. But that being said, if there are good grounds for changing place names, then perhaps those, those place names should be changed. Uh, and so that's uh, something to, to keep in mind. <clears throat> Another key argument, and there's only one more after this, is um, it, it's too expensive, right? It's gonna cost money to change the names of the signs. It's too inconvenient. People are gonna have to change, if it's a street, if it's a street name, they're gonna have to change their driver's license and change their documents and things. And there, there's some validity to this, but, um, but if you think about the broad, like the broader annual budget of a city um, or a municipality, um, you know, changing some street signs is, is um, is really not that expensive in, in, in the broader sense of uh, city budgets and, and that sort of thing. Yes, it, it likely will cause some inconvenience, but do the, do the benefits outweigh the costs uh, in the broader scheme of things? And finally, one of the um, uh, other arguments that you often hear is it's merely symbolic or performative, that <clears throat> it's just putting on a show uh, it's virtue signaling, uh, and it doesn't really address the real issues of the day. Uh, the important kind of structural issues of, say, systemic racism in society more broadly. Uh, and this is a tricky, uh, tricky argument because, uh, th and this argument is not only made by, by conservatives, but in some cases by progressives as well, um, to say that we shouldn't just be dealing with these superficial kind of symbolic issues, but look at kind of issues of poverty or defunding the police or whatever, whatever kind of uh, more structural issues are at play. Uh, and I would argue that, you know, first of all, symbols do matter in terms of uh, creating a sense of belonging uh, for people in public spaces. Uh, and, um, you know, if there's, now that being said, if there's no meaningful change beyond simply the renaming, then that is an issue uh, that if it doesn't address those broader issues, but it doesn't have to be a zero sum game that you can do both, right? You can address the symbolic landscape as well as trying to deal with the more structural issues in society as well. And these are often can, can be part of a common social movement that, so you can see them as, as part of, as a pair rather than uh, seeing them separately. But if it's just a matter of patting ourselves on the back and saying, look at, uh, look at how great we, we changed this name um, and that's all we do, then that's, then that's not really enough, right? So I think that's where that argument's kind of coming from. All right, so um, with that as kind of background, I wanna share um, some of my own experiences here over the past decade, <clears throat> how I've kind of, how my research and teaching ideas have developed over time in relation to some of these issues uh, and um, so I, got, I arrived here at UVic in 2009, and this was the same year that the governments of Washington State, British Columbia, the U.S. and Canada renamed, decided to officially rename the water along the coast here as the Salish Sea in recognition of the Coast Salish peoples who have lived here since time immemorial. And um, this was also kind of a, um, an effort by environmental scientists to create a sense of a bioregion, right? Uh, having a, a, you know, a single name for the entire water body rather than solely referring to it as with these colonial names of Strait of Georgia, Juan de Fuca and Puget Sound. 
Uh, and so interestingly, you know, the, um, some people were against this, you know, the, there, were, there were some representatives from the Monarchist League of Canada, for instance, that said, well, the Strait of Georgia is named after King George III. And so if you're going to mess with that name by putting this other name on it, then that's a problem. Um, but the, um, you know, the, ad, the ad, advocates for this renaming were pretty strategic because they said, you know, in this case, we're not going to dename the Strait of Georgia, but we're going to overlay the Salish Sea kind of on top of that in a sense. Um, and so, so that was one kind of key, um, key event related to place naming that, that occurred when I first arrived here. And one of my master's students um, wrote his master's thesis on the renaming of the Salish Sea. And we published an article about that in the Canadian Geographer in 2015, I think, or, or, or so. So also the same year I arrived here, um, I was teaching this cultural <laughs> geography class and some students told me some interesting stories. First of all, that a few months prior to my arrival, there was a statue of Judge Matthew Begbie, as you see there on the slide, that was stolen from the law building um, in 2009, mysteriously disappeared overnight after a number of years of student kind of activism related to that statue. Um, and in fact, um, about a decade earlier, in, in around the year 2000 or so, um, the law building here at UVic was named after Judge Matthew Begbie, which maybe since you're a law student, you probably know who Begbie was. He played an important role in kind of Canadian, the history of Canadian law. And um, so they renamed the law building um, and, and it's now called the Fraser Building. And, and then in 2009, the statue of Begbie uh, went missing and no one quite knows what happened to it. At least they won't admit what happened to it. I have interviewed, um, as part of my Shirk project, I have interviewed a few of the law professors who were there at the time and got their perspective on it. And um, <clears throat> in any case, um, in 2010, there was also a movement that my students brought to my attention uh, to rename a building on campus, which was a residence hall named after Joseph Trutch, who was a land commissioner um, in the 19th century. He was also the first Lieutenant Governor of British Columbia. And uh, Trutch was um, perhaps more than anyone else in 19th century uh, BC was responsible for dramatically reducing the size of First Nations land reserves. Um, and so if you compare the size of land reserves in BC to pretty much all of the other provinces across the country, um, BC has among the smallest by area us land reserves in the, in, in the country. And this is largely due to the role of Joseph Trutch. And so the fact that there was a building named after Trutch on campus um, led to students to kind of uh, protest and create a petition to petition the university to rename the building. This was in 2010. And um, the uh, then president of UVic, uh, David Turpin, uh, you know, was chairing the naming committee at that time. And the naming committee uh, rejected the proposal in I think around 2011 or so. <clears throat> around that same time when, when uh, David Turpin, the president of UVic uh, was, was uh, on his last uh, kind of term as president on his way out, uh, the university, that same committee named a building after Turpin on campus. So he's, you know, he got a building named after himself while he was rejecting uh, removing the Trutch name from, from campus. And the, um, the geography, uh, my department is in the Turpin building now. So, uh, so this kind of hits, hits home for me in particular. Um, and so anyhow, you know, over the, over, that was around 2010, 2011 or so, uh, over the years, you know, since then, um, I had incorporated this debate within my social and cultural geography class, you know, I had the students debate whether or not the university should rename the Trutch building. I actually a few years ago served on that same naming committee, I wanted to get an inside view as to how these things operate. And as you might imagine, most of the issues that these um, these naming committees deal with relate to uh, wealthy donors who are donating money, and then the university names a building after them and, and these sorts of things. Uh, so in any case, um, so if we fast forward to 2017, um, there was another effort and another petition to rename the Trutch uh, building on campus. This time, uh, an indigenous studies student was taking a class, wrote a paper on Joseph Trutch. The student was living in the Trutch building at the time and called on the university to rename the building. And this is after the Truth and Reconciliation Commission report from 2015. Uh, you know, this is two years, <coughs> two years later, there's a new president of the university um, you know, the climate of dealing with issues of reconciliation had has started to shift. And so the university, in fact, did rename the Trutch building in 2017. I then got involved with a student uh, who had led that effort uh, because there's a there's a street 
uh, named after Trush in Victoria as well as in Vancouver. And th this image that you see here is from, from Vancouver, where a few years earlier, um, there were some efforts to try to rename Trutch Street in Vancouver. Um, and, um, and so we tried to uh, do the same thing here in Victoria, where we held um, myself and the, and, the, and the student and um, one of the city councilors and also the indigenous, <coughs> indigenous Solidarity Working Group. We held a public forum discussing the legacy of Joseph Trutch uh, and then you know, call, uh, and called on the city to rename uh, the, the street, um, which is just a small two block long street uh, in, in Victoria. And um, this, this has not yet happened. Uh, there are a number of things that kind of um, uh, shifted the attention away from this campaign. Uh, and partly we were also somewhat hesitant because uh, when we, um, when we tried to consult with the Songhees and Esquimalt nations, um, we never heard back from them. And, and so they, they seemed to have other priorities at the time. In fact, one of their priorities was removing the statue of John A. MacDonald, uh, which occurred a few months later um, uh, and which I'll get to in just a moment. Um, uh, but you know, receiving some media um, attention from this Trudge campaign, uh, Stephanie, I don't know if you encountered any any backlash from your efforts, but this is uh, some uh, uh, something I received in my office mailbox um, from an anonymous source um, who had literally ripped a page out of a history book with the biography of Joseph Trutch, which is a photograph you see there of Trutch, and underlined his name and wrote in an ancient or or kind of. Alf Germanic <laughs> alphabet called ruins. Uh, I had to kind of look this up. I don't know if anyone speaks this, like, uh, understands this, these symbols here, but it, it means karma, I believe, in the ruins alphabet uh, with a message from the ghost of Joe Trutch saying that basically may the, may the ruins of reality whip your sorry asses. So not too pleased with our, our uh, effort to rename the street. Um, so this gives you some sense of uh, the the kind of the state of public discourse uh, in, in some of these issues. <clears throat> so as I said, part of why that the kind of renamed Trutch campaign, Tr Trutch Street campaign uh, was put on hold is because the attention really shifted to the removal, removal of the Johnny McDonald statue in August of 2018. Uh, <laughs> here you see the, the statue removed from City Hall. As you all know, Johnny McDonald is the first prime minister of Canada. Um, also one of the chief architects of the residential school system that contributed to the, to the genocide of indigenous peoples. Uh, and so this was, um, this, the removal of this statue <coughs> was part of the, the official um, formal reconciliation process between the city of Victoria and the Songhees and Esquimalt nations. And there was a group called the City Family that was created, which consisted of uh, representatives from the city council, the mayor and a few councillors, as well as representatives from uh, Songhees and Esquimalt and, and a number of other indigenous representatives as well. Uh, and so that was something that they had discussed for, for about a year. And then um, in, 20, in August 2018, it, it was um, the city council voted to, to, to follow their recommendation to remove the, the statue. Uh, and so I'm sure many of you kind of saw the media coverage related to this. Um, and this question of erasing history really came to the fore. <clears throat> conservative groups like BC Proud, and here you see Aaron Gunn, who's one of the representatives, uh, launched a kind of um, a pretty strategic campaign to try to challenge the city's decision to remove the statue, saying that this was erasing history. <clears throat> On the other side, you had um, uh, the mayor of the city of Victoria, Lisa Helps, uh, saying that no, in fact, we're not proposing to erase history, but rather to engage in the tr uh, truth telling about history uh, th through the reconciliation process to tell the complex, the, the complex history that is um, that of, of this country and this region. <clears throat> so the city put a plaque, a historic plaque, kind of explaining why they re <laughs> removed the statue. And within less than 24 hours, the, the plaque was vandalized with a big X mark kind of scratched uh, across it. Um, and as you see here, it's perhaps a coincidence, but the center point of this X was right at the words complex history. So they're trying to place complex history under erasure in a sense, uh, you might say. <clears throat> so I knew that you know, these, these, uh, these issues of erasing history were, were often part of the, the kind of reaction to these sorts of things. Uh, and so <clears throat> I, um, I was actually kind of connected with the Indigenous Solidarity Working Group uh, at the time that, that helped organize one of the rallies uh, that was supporting the city in opposition to a counter rally that the BC Proud uh, group uh, had organized on the day of the statue removal. And so my message there, which was kind of picked up by, by CBC and various other news organizations, was that we're not erasing history, but we're rather making history 
by renaming a place or removing a statue. <clears throat> and um, this, of course, encountered some backlash, um, you know, oftentimes when you get media attention. So just one a response here from at not woke 45 uh, on Twitter said, hey, Rose Redwood, check it out. More people who aren't erasing history, but making it, right? And this is, of course, uh, a book burning, a Nazi book burning in Berlin in 1933. So there, <clears throat> there's this attempt to conflate the removal of a statue or the renaming of a place with, you know, book burnings and, and various other uh, efforts. Uh, and so this really got me thinking, you know, of course, you know, it's just a Twitter post or whatever, but it got me thinking about this question of erasure <clears throat> and memory and forgetting. And <clears throat> there's a broad literature in geography and more broadly in the social sciences <clears throat> and humanities on uh, memory, the relations between memory and forgetting. Uh, and one article that might be of interest to you all um, is a piece in Memory Studies uh, by Paul Connerton called Seven Types of Forgetting. <clears throat> and one of the things that Connerton does in this article is he, he looks at the, <clears throat> the idea of repressive erasure. And repressive erasure does in fact include things like book burnings, destroying libraries, trying to basically eradicate the memory of either an individual or an event from the public record. So things like, um, you know, that you would see in the book 1984 and kind of trying to uh, kind of change the historical record so that it suits a particular uh, agenda um, is, uh, is what we might think of as part of repressive erasure. <clears throat> but this got me thinking about whether or not forgetting and erasure are synonymous or, or are there in fact other types of erasure that are perhaps not repressive or not as repressive? Um, or are there different layers of, of erasure within the landscapes uh, that kind of create a more complex, nuanced understanding of what's going on. <clears throat> so I'm in. I'm. These ideas are still somewhat, somewhat uh, in in um, kind of works in progress. But I've developed kind of a typology of different types of spatial erasure. <clears throat> so on the one hand, you have repressive erasure, what Connerton calls repressive erasure. But I would argue you, there are several different types of repressive erasure. <clears throat> so on the one hand, you have what we might call erasure by obliteration. Uh, which is one of the most extreme forms of repressive erasure, uh, includes things like book burnings and, and things of that sort. Uh, but another form of repressive erasure is what we might call erasure by dispossession, uh, which, and here I'm drawing on the work of David Harvey, he has a concept called accumulation by, by dispossession. And um, this involves what we might think of as uh, the material and symbolic erasures associated with colonial conquest, imperial domination, and other forms of dispossession. And the third type of erasure of um, repressive erasure is erasure by sanitization. And this refers to the, <laughs> um, the use of historical narratives that only present the positive aspects of a given historical process while omitting its negative effects. Right? So in addition to these, um, these forms of repressive erasure, um, there's, <clears throat> I would argue there's several other types of erasure. So for instance, restorative erasure refers to um, the restoration, let's say, of indigenous <coughs> place names or indigenous sense of place that has previously been placed under erasure by settler colonialism. And in the process, one or more uh, commemorative uh, colonial uh, commemorative objects might be removed, such as the removal of the statue or removing a colonial street name. By contrast, um, reparative erasure occurs not, not so much through attempting to restore uh, a previous place name, um, say an indigenous place name, but rather through the redistribution of honorific recognition to compensate for an existing imbalance within a commemorative landscape. And here I'm thinking of, you know, um, efforts in the United States to rename places after Martin Luther King Jr., Cesar Chavez, and, and others, <clears throat> uh, other uh, non-white individuals where much of the commemorative landscape is, is kind of highly skewed towards white European me men, uh, to, be, to be frank. And then lastly, um, we might think of what we could call relocative erasure, the process where a commemorative object, say a statue, uh, is removed from one place and then relocated to a different place. Uh, and this is um, uh, it's still too early to say what's uh, happening with the John A. McDonald statue here in Victoria. Uh, it's currently sitting in, in city storage at some undisclosed location, but some have argued that it should be put up next to the legislative building or put in a museum uh, and that sort of thing. So that might be what we could call relocative erasure. So these are some different types of er spatial erasure. Um, they're not necessarily mutually exclusive. In fact, perhaps you all can think of other types of erasure that I haven't listed here, but it's just some, some ideas to, to try to think about 
not conflating, you know, these two different types of erasure that are going on because restorative erasure is, is trying to reckon with historical injustices and prior acts of, er of repressive erasure by, by colonialism, let's say, to kind of re to respond to that through the process of reconciliation or decolonization. Th that's a very different thing than, than trying to burn history books and things like that. I don't think any of the advocates of statue removal or renaming pl uh, places are advocating we should destroy libraries and archives and history books. And in fact, um, when, when these debates over renaming a street or a place or removing a statue arise, people often learn more about history than they knew previously, because a lot of that gets buried in, in the mythologies of nationalism that people learn in, in, uh, in the public schools, right? Uh, and so I am mindful of time. I do wanna <laughs> leave some time uh, at the end here, but just briefly, I want to touch on um, kind of a distinction between anti-colonial uh, kind of erasure and decolonial uh, efforts to reclaim uh, places. And so uh, some of you may, may be aware of in 2013 here in, um, in Coast Salish territories in Victoria, uh, there was uh, a movement to reclaim the indigenous place name of Pakals uh, for the um, mountain that's referred to by settler uh, colonial uh, society as Mount Douglas. Mount Douglas named after one of the early governors of, of, um, of BC during the colonial period in the 19th century. And, um, and so there was an effort by Wasanich nations along with uh, their allies to reclaim uh, Pakals, which is the uh, Senchothan or, or uh, Wasanich name for this mountain. Uh, and this was around the time of the Idle No More movement and the uh, indigenous nationhood movement that was pretty strong here in, in, in Victoria. Uh, and so, um, so just briefly, just I want to give you a sense of uh, uh, take you there for a moment. So, um, <clears throat> so everyone kind of marched up the, the top of the mountain, and at the peak, they placed this be beautifully carved sign with the indigenous place name uh, there. Um, and they did this without the permission of the district of Saanich, the municipal government. Right? They did not ask permission to install this sign. Uh, and um, and so, as part of <clears throat> this process, uh, they actually um, reenacted the signing of the Douglas Treaty. Um, and so they even had a, an actor dress up as James Douglas and, uh, and kind of reenacted this process. And, and there was some very interesting kind of discourse as part of that, where some of the indigenous um, uh, speakers uh, kind of questioned the Douglas Treaty and its legitimacy and, and, and things like that. So, um, so it was quite an interesting kind of performative enactment and reenactment of, of placemaking. And as part of that process, um, there, there was a signing of the Declaration Reclaiming Pakals. <clears throat> that the um, that the chiefs, uh, various chiefs, uh, signed <clears throat> on that day, uh, and um, shortly thereafter, within within a week or so uh, after, the sign that had been installed mysteriously disappeared from the mountaintop, and no one quite knew what happened to it, uh, and until um, it was revealed that the district of Saanich, the the kind of settler colonial government, kind of removed this the the sign, uh, and there <clears throat> they did so on grounds of that um, they were concerned about some electrical wires they claimed uh, underneath the asphalt there. Um, and so in any case, what they did was they relocated the sign right next, just to the right of, of where it, it had previously been, directly next to the Mount Douglas Park Charter. Uh, and this is a quite an interesting contrast between an indigenous kind of reclamation of a place and right next to the, the kind of a, a plaque that that reinforces the, the crown's authority over these lands, right? And so these kind of dual sovereignties and competing senses of place uh, are, are side by side there uh, on the mountain. And one of the things that was interesting is that when this was going on in Victoria, in Toronto, there, um, I remember at the time seeing, uh, seeing this image here uh, in solidarity with, Pakal, with reclaiming Pakals, there were indigenous um, activists, artists, uh, in um, in Toronto that started putting the names of in indigenous names on street signs uh, around the city. Uh, and <clears throat> this was part of uh, a, a project called Ogima Mikana uh, that, um, that uh, was again, around the time of Idle No More, uh, that was putting these various uh, indigenous street signs uh, around the city. And this eventually got the attention of the business, one of the business associations. And they actually then installed um, kind of official uh, street signs with these indigenous um, 
indigenous names on them. And on the one hand, this this is you know this sounds great, and on the other hand, you you do kind of wonder. And in fact, uh, some of the the indigenous activists uh, who had led this effort initially kind of wondered if this was maybe a co-op, uh, a sense of co-opting uh, a somewhat radical kind of uh, direct action into a more mainstream reformist project. So um, anyhow, that, that's certainly a debate that, that could be had. Um, but one of the things that's interesting is that uh, various universities, um, I guess at least UBC in particular, uh, here in Vancouver <clears throat> has um, really kind of taken the lead on this as well. They've, they've included indigenous uh, names on street signs throughout their campus campuses and um, they have a website um, with Musqueam street names, you know, describing, um, describing the, the street names, their meaning, and even having audio files with how to pronounce the street, the, the name, the indigenous names, uh, and so on. And just uh, kind of maybe I'll kind of close here. Uh, at the University of Victoria, I had um, advocated that we should do the same similar thing, uh, but it hasn't, it hasn't come to pass and I'm not on that naming committee anymore. Uh, but one of the last things that I, I was involved in here on campus before I left the, the naming committee was when the Trutch building was, rena was renamed, they just gave it a placeholder name of Lansdowne Building Number One, is, which is what it's called now, with the understanding that it would eventually get a permanent name at some point in the future after consulting with um, the First People's House and others. And one of the things that they realized <coughs> was that um, the definition of honorific naming in the university's naming policy was only in reference to recognizing individuals. And as, as you probably know, you know, within indigenous cultures, that sense of individualism is, is, not, is not as strong in terms of naming traditions. And so there's often um, more of an effort to name um, places after collectives like the First People's House, rather than naming that after um, an individual indigenous person. Although the interesting case that Stephanie's been involved with does name a park after an indigenous uh, woman. But, um, <clears throat> but one of the things our naming committee did uh, right before I, I left the committee was we redefined the, the term honorific in the policy so that it includes not just naming, uh, recognizing individuals, <clears throat> but also uh, could be in recognition of a concept, a word, a value, a place, uh, or uh, the history of the lands on which the university stands which kind of opens the possibility to uh, engage in more indigenous forms of naming on campus. Um, so with that, I think, I think I'll end and hopefully we have some time for, for questions. I would like to thank uh, Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council and, and uh, UVic as a work study um, program, <coughs> as well as um, uh, my co-investigator, my wife, Cindy Ann, and the team of uh, RAs, grads and undergrads. Uh, and um, I just wanted briefly, I know we're, we're getting a little bit uh, uh, closing time here, um, but I just briefly wanted to share with you before we start the discussion, um, a, um, the, the web map that, um, that I've been creating uh, with, along with some, the help of some, uh, some students here. Uh, so if you just bear with me for one second. <clears throat> um, so we've, using our database, we've, um, we've looked at um, you know, universities across the, the US and Canada that have naming policies that are publicly accessible. And so each of these dots is a, um, is a university that has a naming policy. And if you click on the link, I don't know if you can see that, it takes you directly to the naming policy. And so this, we're hoping this can be kind of a resource for those people in, interested in these issues. Uh, we're also, um, another <clears throat> point here, we've looked at um, you know, universities that have, uh, have experienced naming controversies um, so if we click on maybe if UVic is here, we talk about the Joseph Trutch building and you know, things like that. <clears throat> um, we've also looked, we're interested in uh, who, who is on these naming committees? Do faculty and students have representation on naming committees, for instance? And so one of the things we've looked at, so this is um, universities that have faculty representation on naming committees. Uh, here is um, universities that have student representation on these naming committees. And, and anyhow, we, uh, there's a whole series of other things uh, that are part of this as well. Um, and just really, really briefly, uh, this is still kind of a work in progress, um, but uh, we're putting together a story map, um, uh, which is kind of a website uh, that presents um, kind of this in a publicly accessible way with some infographics uh, and, and kind of brings you to the, to the maps that we've, we've um, We've produced and and even has a um, you know, some statistics related to the percentage of universities that have student or faculty representation and in the U.S. and Canada and that sort of thing. <clears throat> and then we've created um, 
these kind of dashboards, kind of like you see with the COVID. Um, yeah, I'll just go back to the, the bottom here has a, a uh, where is it? Here it is here, if you can see this, um, kind of a, almost one of those COVID type dashboards with our data um, of looking at um, university policies that mention diversity or the controversies um, and, and things like that. So uh, anyhow, I think, um, I think maybe I'll end. I've talked too long now, so let's leave some time for discussion. So uh, thanks so much for your attention, everyone. Wow, that was that was awesome. Thank that was way more than I expected. My, my, I think my brain's gonna explode. That was really great. Thank you so much, Ruben. Um, I think we have time for some questions, if that's okay, if you guys don't mind taking some time for some questions. And if it's okay, I'm gonna start because I have one that's literally been burning in my brain since we we first emailed. And that is um, how do you explain that in Quebec they name everything after everybody, every street corner parquet has is named after someone obviously there's some names that come up a lot Champlain Cartier but how do you explain that they're so progressive and willing and I don't know if it's part of the je me souviens culture of Quebec but that's kind of my my one burning question I have and then we can have anyone else ask their question well um it's interesting that you asked that because you know I've, I've never been to Quebec and and oh. you all are probably much more knowledgeable about Quebec and it's it's uh, naming history than than I am per se um you know, I, I know that, yeah, I mean, I, I'd be interested in, in wondering, you know, they name places after different people, but is there like, is there diversity in that naming or are there, um, you know, how many places are named after, you know, immigrants or racialized minorities and, and those sorts of questions that would be my question to follow back with. But, um, but yeah, different, different cities like New York City um, ha names, uh, has not just the official name, but also these, these honorific names that like, so they might even have Two, two names for a given street, one that's kind of the official name and one that's the commemorative name. And, and, um, and so I don't know if, if uh, say Montreal or, or cities uh, in Quebec do, do the same thing as well. Um, but, um, but naming, you know, as I said, you know, you could say it's merely symbolic, but symbols do matter. And, and in many cases, like municipalities, some municipalities like New York City, like they spend a lot of time like renaming streets and, and renaming parks and, and, um, and it's, and it is it cre it's part of creating the cultural landscape, and so it it, it um uh, it really does um, you know serve a broader purpose of creating trying to create a sense of belonging, or at least it could, uh, or it can create a sense of sense of exclusion from from public space as well. Uh, and so um so yeah, you you'd have a better sense of which which one of those uh, is most prevalent in Quebec than I would. <laughs> Um, thank you. Uh, does anybody else? I'm just going to put it on the gallery view here. Does anybody else have a question for Ruben? Yeah, uh, uh, Gabrielle. Oh, hi. I see Gabrielle. Okay. Um, so my question was, um, in the case of renaming um, a street or or um, or something after a person, must there be a link between? that person and the area or um, do you find it's important to to have that um, that connection or um, yeah that, that's my question that's that's a great question and often um oftentimes I mean it does vary from city to city but um <clears throat> but oftentimes cities do have in their bylaws you know um, it does state that um, that the individual should have at least some connection to the city uh, and ideally, you know, even a connection to that specific place or that street or that area of the city. Um, <clears throat> I know that's something uh, in um, a lot of the commemorative naming in New York City, as I mentioned, um, they try to, um, like, for instance, there's a, a small, small street corner named after Edgar Allan Poe, for instance, and it's because he lived at that street corner at one point in time and then, you know, uh, when he was living in the city. And, and so I, I do think that that's often important. Uh, consideration for many cities. So if there's a if there's an effort to rename a street after someone that's never been to that city uh, and it's more of a kind of international figure, let's say, um, that often runs up against the uh, controversy about, well, this person never has no connection to this city and so why should we name a street after them? Uh, and uh, there was an effort um, and perhaps it's still ongoing to name uh, streets after Mahatma Gandhi around the world and it has occurred in a number of places. Uh, but Gandhi lately has had some controversies associated with his with his legacy, and so there's been some efforts to to remove his his name and his commemorations uh, from him from from some places as well. 
Um, there are some uh, examples, I'm forgetting the exact places, but um, places named after kind of international kind of political figures um, that, um, and sometimes this kind of ties you into the geopolitics of naming, you know, there, um, there's sometimes um, where um, if there's an embassy uh, of a country uh, and that country is involved in some human rights scandal or something like that, that um, there's, there have been efforts to, to change the address of, um, of the street that, that that embassy is lined up against uh, to in honor of a dissident uh, from that country. Uh, who's been oppressed or or, or even killed, um, uh, and so um so so naming can be used for geopolitical purposes in that case, and in those cases it has nothing to do with that person living on that in that area. It's almost a, a global or international kind of uh, uh, naming process that 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 takes place. So um so there there are kind of a variety of different uh, things that happen, but I think you're right that in in many cases um there there's cities usually kind of want to have some connection to the, to the place itself. In relation to the individual, and there's also sometimes policies that say that you shouldn't name places after living people as well. There's some some bylaws or or, land, uh, or ordinances related to that, um, and but other cities don't have those policies. And so uh, when you name places after living people, and then they somehow come into disrepute, uh, maybe at a later date, um, that can lead to to issues um, as well. So, great question though. Yeah, I'm curious uh, if you have questions or even just any other reactions to any comments from my, my presentation or things you, you all are working on. Rachel, I think you had, a, you had your hand up. I did. Thank you so much for spending your morning with us. And I was just wondering, um, in the case of Victoria, were there instances where they you know, updated their official plans or bylaw to reflect the changes that they're currently making? Or has it really been all, like on a one-off basis? It's interesting, you know, um, when I was involved in the effort to rename Trutch Street, I was talking to one of the city councilors and I was like, how do you actually, what's the process by which you would do this? And we started looking, we realized that the city of Victoria does not have a naming policy. It doesn't have a policy. Like I've looked on its website. I mean, it has a streets policy and I've looked on there and it does say that there, that when a developer kind of lays out a subdivision, like there should be appropriate street signs put in place. Um, but it doesn't have like a set of processes of this is how you go about naming a street. And, um, <clears throat> and so when I was, yeah, from what I recall talking to the city council, they were saying, well, most people think it's the city council that makes that decision, but it's actually the city engineer who makes that decision. And, and so there's a lot of confusion, actually. <laughs> um, so one effort would, you know, that we've talked about, that I've talked about with that, with that particular city councilor, um, is uh, to uh, to perhaps create a naming policy for the city of Victoria, and um, you know I'm not a lawyer and legal expert, um, but um, maybe there's some law students that can help us out. But um, but uh, but yeah, I mean that's but a few years ago, there was an effort to create a naming rights policy for the city, and I was actually opposed to that because naming rights um, refers more to the the commodification of public place names, the selling of place names to private corporations and, and individuals and to make re to generate revenue for the city. Uh, and this I see kind of as a neoliberal attempt to privatize public space and kind of all that stuff. So, um, so I kind of came out against that at the time and created a petition like to get the, the city not to do that. And so they, they ended up not doing it, but, um, but, um, but the city certainly needs a naming policy, you know, and uh, which should in incorporate kind of getting um, feedback from local First Nations and kind of all those sorts of things as well. So I think that would be an important step to take. Um, so that kind of gives you a sense that there is no policy here um, as far as I'm aware. So. Vanessa, I think you had your, your hand up. Yes, and I'll be quick because I actually uh, teach a class very shortly, but um, two quick things. So first a question for you, Ruben, about you know, what your perception as a geographer is about the role of law in these spaces, um, because that's obviously a preoccupation for us. And, you know, it seems to me like there are, as you're saying, like different jurisdictions have, you know, some have policies, some don't, some have a formal process, um, some don't. 
uh, you know, sometimes there are ways to, to try to change a name once one has been created. Like, is it, you know, is there one process to name something the first time and another to, um, to change a name um, because the existing name is problematic or just to try to diversify names? Like, so it seems to me that, um, there, you know, the process piece of this is potentially quite important. And to me, that kind of conjures up um, questions of administrative law, like the existence of local bylaws and of certain procedural requirements um, that give individuals and communities an opportunity to feed into that process. So just curious to hear, you know, your uh, uh, some insights about for you, like, where do you see law popping up either for good or for ill, right? Because I think it can be both. Um, and then second, just a quick observation on you know, this is such interesting research and, and I really look forward to, to kind of digging into it a little bit more. I wonder if by sort of taking on the word erasure and, and sort of using it in ways you're accepting, um, you're sort of accepting some of the framing of um, groups who would oppose um, place naming or renaming. Um, so, you know, when you said at the beginning to me, to, to us, you know, um, place names are honorifics, that really resonated for me. And to me, once we understand that, then the naming piece kind of like the, the dynamics of that fall into place quite quickly. Um, and I wonder if erasure does that same thing or if erasure to me, when you say, well, this is an honorific and in the current context, continuing to honor that person who is responsible for, you know, racial violence or for um, like a real significant colonial legacy, um, you know, that honorific is not appropriate in the present. I, that really makes sense to me. And I wonder if by saying, no, it's a form of restorative erasure, you're, you're almost accepting that there is an erasing going on that, that maybe maybe you don't even think is really occurring and so I just I, just a question about whether that that term goes further than you want it to go essentially yeah I think that's a great point um and it is interesting to think about because yeah I totally agree that um framing it in terms of honorific uh you know commemoration is is the way to go um but so I I, to, I completely disagree with the notion that uh, that na renaming is erasing history, but when you're removing a place name, you are you are deleting something from the landscape and then maybe replacing it with something else. So so there there is some type of something's being erased, but it's it's not what the reactionary uh, kind of critics would have us believe. And so um, so that's where I try to kind of create a more positive notion of say restorative erasure, which is linked to uh, reclaiming indigenous place names and things like that, um, that, that you are, I mean, so I, I don't think we can get around the fact that we are, you know, kind of deleting or removing something, an object or a name from a landscape. And, and so if we're, if we acknowledge that, the, and that is a form of, I think, a form of erasure of, at least of the honorific, um, then we can kind of reappropriate the notion of erasure. And so that's not only associated with book burnings and having this very negative repressive connotation, uh, but has other other kind of valences and other meanings to it. Um, so that's part of what I'm trying to do. But I, I totally get the notion that um, that once you make that acknowledgement about you know other forms of erasure, the attention should shift back to the importance of honorific uh, commemoration, and not just honorific commemoration, but other types of naming that aren't about commemoration as well. I mean, um, or or commemoration in a broader sense of not just honoring an individual, but or uh, kind of tapping into the to the creation stories of a people, or or kind of their sense of place, um, and um, and kind of all of the kind of cultural uh, practices associated with that. So um, so I think that it's an important move to um, to kind of shift the notion of erasure. Uh, but that's not the end of the story. We shouldn't only be thinking about the erasure because there's the decommemoration and then there's the recommemoration, like what or the remaking of that place after. And that's where a more de, um, kind of um, the shift, the, I guess the difference between say anti-colonialism, which is kind of, we need to remove these colonial statues or, or names and decolonial <laughs> practices, which are reclaiming indigenous place names and or, or honorific commemorations of a different sort. 
Um, so that's maybe the distinction between erasure is more dealing with like anti-colonialism. You're removing these things from the landscape. And, and then after that, there's the decolonial move. So I guess, I don't know if that, that helps. Um, but there is, um, yeah, that question about administrative uh, law that um, there's a whole field that you might be aware of called legal geographies. And, and I'm, I'm not an expert in that field. Uh, uh, Nicholas Blomley, who's one of my colleagues at SFU is, is one of the leading people there. Um, but, um, but yeah, I certainly think um, this question of process is important. And in fact, in a lot of the historical work that, that I've done and, and others have done is, is about looking at um, city council records and kind of the, the policies and procedures of how these, these place renamings occur. And um, so that's a lot, there's been a lot of scholarship kind of looking at the historical uh, process of, and those procedures and all that th uh, stuff. Um, yeah, I find that really interesting. Um, you know, in the case of, of the reclaiming of Pakals, on the other hand, <clears throat> um, as I said, like that reclaiming of that indigenous place name occurred without the permission of, of the law, of the colonial law, you know, structure. And um, so I also think there's an interesting question about indigenous law and conception and ties to place and settler law. And here at UVic, you know, we've just created um, uh, one of the first like joint indigenous and kind of Canadian law programs uh, or centers here in on campus. And so those folks probably have a lot more <laughs> to say about that than I do, than I, than I uh, have expertise with. But, um, but I certainly think those are very important uh, things to, to, to look into, yeah. Does that, does that help with the, the erasure piece? Um, because yeah, I, I spend most of my time arguing against the e erasing history argument. And so, yes. um, so the last thing I wanna do is, is kind of like cave into, their, cave into that argument. But, I, but I, I think, well, how can we productively reappropriate kind of that notion and expand its meaning as, as a moment in an analysis to then move beyond it, you know? Yes, that yeah, that does make sense. I, yes, I think it makes sense when it's, yeah, I, I see what you're saying. That was very helpful. Yeah. And I'm sorry, I have to run guys. I, I could stay here okay. forever, but it was so nice to of you to, to join us. Thanks. My pleasure. Thanks for, okay. thanks for coming. Um, I think we have uh, Jasmine. She has a question yep. as well. Yeah. Um, so my project is actually really focused on uh, like naming spaces on the in the university context as well. So I also just wanted to like commend you for your like database and those story maps. I think those are super interesting, and I'd love to get the links to those later to look through it um, uh, in detail. Yeah. Um, I actually um, the story map that I showed you is still um, you kind of need the password and things, but I do okay. have um, I have a, a link um, that I, I shared with someone at. I gave a talk at UC Berkeley a few days ago and, and shared them. Um, so here, let me see if this, I don't know, does that work? I, if you all click on that, can you actually see the story map? Um, uh, this is a version of it. I don't know if it's been kind of publicly released yet, but um, you might be able to access the, the web map at least from that link. Um, but it's, uh, it's still a little bit of a work in progress. We're still updating some of the pop-up boxes and stuff, but um, does that work or not? Yeah, I think it works actually. For yeah. me, it's working. Great, great. It works yeah, for me too. Play around oh, with that. Now you've ruined my afternoon. Thank you so much. <laughs> and it's only updated up to 2020, and uh, there's probably more updates we need to do to it. Uh, it's something that I'm probably going to have to do on a regular annual basis mm -hmm. with work study students. So. Okay, very cool. And then also, while you are compiling this data, like, did you notice any particular trends um, in the naming policies, maybe like geographically or anything like that? Um, so there was, um, particularly related to comparing the U S and Canada. Um, maybe if I just, um, go back to, uh, let's see, where was that? Um, go back to the story map for a second. Um, that, you know, in, in those charts that I, that we have here kind of lays some of those trends. Um, so for instance, oh. <clears throat> this isn't geographically across, you know, across, um, but we do have that data as well. Um, but, you know, if you compare the U.S. and Canada, what we found is um, around 59% of Canadian universities have kind of publicly accessible naming policies, whereas only 26% of U.S. institutions have those. Um, so it seems to be much more widely accessible, at least in terms of being, you know, being able to ac access online. Or I think my students even emailed some of the universities to try to get, you know, copies if they weren't online as well. Um, and, um, and so, yeah, so there definitely were some trends comparing the US and Canada. So for instance, in Canada, um, faculty have representation on, uh, you know, 29% of the, um, of the, of the naming committees, whereas in the US only 4% of the, 
of naming committees that universities have have faculty representation. Similarly, you know, twelve percent of uh, uh, for students uh, in Canada, whereas only three um, percent in the U.S. And this is partly related to. Um, you know, partly related to the fact that there are many more universities in the U.S. than there are in Canada, so that probably kind of skews some of these numbers. <clears throat> um, so th those, yeah, we're beyond that. We're still kind of in the process of um, of trying to analyze like spatial patterns in the data, and we haven't actually published this. Where that's hopefully something I can work on this summer uh, if I have time with uh, other obligations. But um, but yeah, that's something we, we certainly plan to look into. And if you if you kind of are playing around with our database and you notice any patterns, feel free to let me know as well. <laughs> Yeah, that's super cool. Those stats are really interesting, actually. Like to see the numbers kind of compared like that. That's awesome. Yeah, thanks. Okay, well, um, I think we've taken up all of your morning and you probably want to catch up with the rest of your day. Uh, but thank you so much, Ruben. This was so fantastic. It was like everything I could have ever asked for. It was great and um, so, so fascinating to get the view from the West Coast too. You know, here in Ottawa, I think it's fair to say we're kind of in a bubble and we think we're very special, <laughs> you know? Um, and so, but I will, I am gonna look into the Quebec stuff with you and get back to you because it really is interesting. They really truly name everything and anything they can get their hands on. So I will definitely. There's very much of an effort to, to use, you know, Francophone names and things like that, right? And so I know like, aren't there kind of naming like policies related to naming places more broadly related to uh, Frank, you know, the French language and, and those sorts of things too. So I know that's, uh, that's important in Quebec as well. So yeah, like where my, my dad is from Quebec and like you, you go to where there's a lot of industry and even a little parquet near the, the big factory is named after the first woman who worked in that factory. Like they're very adamant about not just naming things after great super political heroes, also just community organizers and trailblazers, that kind of thing. So that's really interesting. Yeah, yeah it's very cool. More about it as well. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Okay. Um, well, if there's no more questions, Jasmine, is your hand still up or was that from before? Or Gabrielle aussi? Oh, no, sorry. It's, it, it was from before. <laughs> okay. I actually have a question. Yeah. Vas-y, Gabrielle. And it's regarding um, the argument that um, sometimes commemorative naming efforts can be perceived as perf perf sorry, performative, I can say, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, so for us students, how could we make sure that our work doesn't fall into that category? Like, um, do you have um, any um, maybe initiatives that we could take along our projects or, um, and how can we make sure that um, it has importance for underrepresented groups? Yeah, well, um, those are both really important questions. I mean, for the last point, um, I think it's really important to make sure that whoever's, whoever are the kind of leading activists and kind of promoting something um, are engaging with and hopefully including, um, you know, those racialized groups and, and others like that are that had the most immediate impact related to a name, um, rather than it just being a bunch of kind of white activists kind of trying to make themselves look good um, while not really consulting with indigenous people or, or uh, African Canadians or others, you know? Um, and so, um, so I think, you know, trying to create a broad coalition to engage in, in, a, in an effort is really important. And that's part of why we kind of actually took a step back from the Trutch rename, uh, the Trutch Street naming thing, because we thought, thought well, Maybe we should put this on hold. If if it's not a priority for the Songhees and Esquimalt nations, then why is it a priority for us? So that that's you know, I guess knowing when to step back and say we're we're going to stop doing this as well, right? To, um, if if it doesn't have uh, up uptake uh, and support, um, and I guess another thing, yeah, the performative question is interesting because um, I think there needs to be a broader kind of linkage between a, a renaming and broader issues beyond the naming itself um, and uh, to kind of draw those connections and and form broad networks of solidarity so that so that renaming a place or removing a statue it's not only about the name or the statue but it's linked to a broader movement of addressing systemic racism in society or, or other particular issues related to to police violence and and you know other issues that are kind of connected to it that so you can see it as as one piece of a broader kind of movement rather than just seeing it in isolation uh, with itself. Another interesting point too, is that 
the term performative actually has different genealogies so that in, in, acad in academic work, some, there's a, um, a uh, there's a whole field called performance studies that comes out of theater and, the, and sociology. And then there's another uh, body of work called on performativity theory, which, which I've also uh, contributed to, um, which comes out of speech act theory and, and kind of linguistic philosophy and things. And, um, and so those notions of performative are much broader than just using the term performative as uh, superficial or kind of uh, putting on a show or pretending to be in solidarity and that sort of thing. Um, you often see that that kind of superficial notion of performative used in uh, social media today and stuff. But um, but the notion of perform like all of social life is performative in the sense that we we performatively enact our our social norms and our identities and in, in in our public and private spaces and and um, and naming is itself a performative act um, of um, bringing into being the spatial identity of a place, um, naming and mapping and things like that. Like those actions kind of constitute the identities of places. Uh, and that's, perf that's a performative act. Uh, and, and so, but that, that's a different meaning of the, the notion of performative than what, what you were just alluding to. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, but, but really trying to not see renaming in isolation, but really trying to link it to broader kind of systemic issues in society. I think that's, if you, if you can try to kind of make those connections, then I, I think that's, you'll be, you know, in pretty good shape. Thank you very much for um, answering my question and taking the time today to um, do this presentation. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thanks. Thanks for coming. And thanks for asking these good questions. Yeah. And I just, um, I don't want to brag about Gabrielle, but uh, she, her and I, we've met with another community association two, three weeks ago in the Glebe, which is kind of this posh neighborhood here in Ottawa. And we're hoping to get the first park named after uh, a black person. So she's uh, she's working hard on that, and uh, we'll keep you posted because I think you start you sparked something here, and uh, I'm really grateful for the help you gave with the Putuguk Park and for meeting with us today. Because, like I said, if it wasn't for you, I always thought I was a crazy person, and then I saw that there was an actual field of study about this, and it's all because of you. So thank you so much, Ruben. Um, I'm sure we'll be in touch. I'm been trolling your uh your website for your lab way too long now um so you'll probably hear from me soon for some sort of collaboration or to do something i'm looking forward to it and uh, i'm sure on behalf of the students they want to thank you as well for taking the time with us this morning and thank you and if there's anything i can do to help with any of your efforts as as the expert place name studies person to support any any uh kind of movements that your your campaigns you're working on i'm more than happy to do so as well so Please do keep me in 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 uh in the loop as to what's going on there. So for sure. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so thank much, you. and um, we look forward to keeping you updated on our efforts. And uh, enjoy the rest of your morning. Okay. You too. Take care, Bye. everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.